uh, with, and this is a, a picture of him with his thesis, which was one of the first mini computers. And you can now find it in the MIT Computer Museum. Um, but I, in the 90s, he started to get a little bored. Uh, you know, he was thinking about Moore's Law, which is um, the, the, the law that says that you know, technology is getting smaller and smaller and cheaper and faster. Uh, but he, he predicted that it was actually going to end eventually. Um, so if he went off on this you know, deep soul searching um, expedition and said, okay, what's next? what is going to be the thing to program in the 21st century if it's not going to be computers? And um, he ended up getting kind of a, an unofficial He started taking graduate students and he, the, the philosophy of his lab was biology is better than at moving atoms than any human transistor. And um, to complement that, it's also codable. So DNA is, you know, A's, T's, C's, and G's. And they're things that, um, that instruct the cell when in put in specific combinations of how to make and how to do different things. Um, and so he saw this vision um, many years uh, in the future of how we were going to be able to do that with biology. And so to not discount all the other technologies that's in this image. Uh, and so at Ginkgo, we see um, you know, glasses and we see programmable materials and, and different types of polymers that you might be able to make with biology. Um, or data storage and this idea that DNA is incredibly stable um, and you know you can you can um, like pull DNA out of you know old old fossils and um, all sorts of things and so can you can you take advantage of that and and use the the very tiny amounts of space that's required um, or create inks and pigments or different types of ingredients for for health and nutrition. Austin Seaport, um, come visit me. I would be happy to show you around. Um, and the idea of the foundry is actually to automate and miniaturize as many of the experiments as possible, um, which helps us rapidly prototype all sorts of different microorganisms. Um, and then on the other side is this, uh, this reusable DNA code base that we're generating. Um, and so this is a bit of circular thinking, but the idea is that the more DNA you write and the more that you, you test it out and understand what it does, um, the, the more of a, a library you have to draw upon for future projects. Um, and so we like to say biology evolved once. Um, and so there's high reusability um, in genetic elements. So you know, we can read um, you know, DNA ostensibly that comes from a plant and vice versa. So this is one of our foundries. Um, this was taken a few months ago and it looks a lot different now. Um, but um, it's essentially a, a mini factory. So we have lots of aut um, automated tools and instruments. Um, everything is on wheels and all the utilities come from the ceiling. Um, so it lends itself to very dynamic space. So as we bring in new types of automation or different projects require us to, to work on different um, things, we can, we can move spaces around. Um, and so this is, this is kind of how a project would flow through the foundry. Um, and I'll go through an example in a second. Um, but the, the, the prototyping really follows the, the same standard engineering process of designing something, um, then you build it, and then you test it. Um, and you iterate through that process in, until you come upon um, that, that final uh, design. Um, we add on as for working with the biological medium. Um, but the idea with each team is, uh, so uh, a customer will come to us and say, I'd like to make anything from a cosmetic ingredient to um, to a polymer, to um, maybe some sort of electronic coding. 
Um, and our, our designers will actually write out um, on a computer all of the different DNA sequences that will um, then be programmed into a cell. Um, and, and so um, BUILD actually is the, the team that will um, take that printed DNA, put it into the cells, and grow them up. Um, and then TEST is where we actually get all of that information for our code base. And so we have a lot of mass spectrometers that identify all the different molecules that are being produced within a cell. Um, so we can say, okay, you know, is it making this fragrance molecule? Is it, is it making this enzyme for, you know, for um, commercial laundry detergent or something like that? Um, and then we iterate through as we, we develop this process. Um, and then fermentation comes into place when we're ready to commercialize the product. And so after many iterations um, and, and thousands of different... Um, worked in the world of fermentation for many, many years. Um, and, and so there are really exciting opportunities for um, using that for industrial biotech. So we're really close to Harpoon Brewery out in the seaport. Um, and so we usually use that as an example of the type of um, facility that uh, would commercialize a product like this. So you've got these massive 100,000 liter containers that are um, you know, filled with lots of sugary substances and enough oxygen and they're worrying about um, and, and these microbes are growing and they're producing, um, it, they're reading the DNA that, um, that is instructing them how to make something new. So it could be... Um, Right now, it requires so much nitrogen fertilizer that's artificially produced uh, that gets put on each crop. Uh, but usually, you have to rotate the crop with something like a lake, a clean, to remove the soil. And, it, and the idea is that uh, legumes actually have these wonderful little microbes that live in the roots of, of these plants. You know, these plants can be like little bungalows for, for these microbes to live in, and they capture nitrogen from the atmosphere turn it into a form that you can use, um, and you don't need to apply any fertilizer. Um, but for um, cereal crops, what uh, we have to do is um, use the Hager Bosch process, which has been very revolutionary in uh, being able to scale up agricultural practices, but it requires 3% of global natural gas and uh, to produce it. And then on the opposite side, Usually there's a, a, a massive amount of runoff that um, ends up leading to eutrophication and to lots of massive dead in the field. So the idea of this company is really to um, to take something that we never had the tools to even begin to really um, to create. application of artificial fertilizer. Uh, so uh, a different type of project, very different than um, ad, is polymer. And so um, we have a strategic partnership with the San Francisco based company called Dianata. And they focus on all sorts of intermediate chemicals. Um, so there are a lot of different things that are really exposed. Um, and so uh, what we're doing with them is actually working on different types of microbial factors microbes that can produce the, the precursors for very good polymers. So something like um, butane diol is uh, a really good chemical that's found in a lot of um, a lot of athletic apparel um, and articles of clothing, um, and electronics, automotive, um, the butylene glycol is found in a lot of cosmetics and personal care products. Um, the one that I'm, I really like is actually um, capillacin. And so this is a molecule that um, 
is the Freaker 13 nylon. And so, and it's Blue 11, and lots of um, it's yoga pants and athletic company, uh, apparel companies um, are really interested in finding new resources um, for um, creating the products that they have and maintaining that functionality without having to use petroleum as a starting material. Um, so, their partner is in a company called Aquafin um, in Italy, and they're working on um, actually augmenting their current supply chain. So, Aquafil creates um, recycled nylon products um, from exclusively nylon that's from the ocean. But the demand for their products right now um, are, are way too high. And so they um, got in touch because they wanted to find a reasonable way to augment the, the supply that they have. So this is a really exciting uh, partnership. Um, and it's, it's something that a lot of people um, in, in lots of different industries are, are really interested in finding ways to supplement petroleum-derived products. Um, then, this is a personal favorite of many people, I think, though. Um, so we actually partnered with a chemist company uh, this past fall. So um, the company's called Kronos Group. Um, they're based up in Toronto. And uh, this was kind of an unusual partnership. Uh, but the idea is, um, so you have uh, you know, two main um, molecules that are found through the cannabis plant, the CAP and PBE. PBE is definitely having a moment right now, which is very exciting uh, for Kronos. Uh, but the plant also makes all of these trace elements, or these trace molecules um, that are classified as cannabinoids. Um, and this is still such a, a new area of research, but um, it, it, they have lots of different applications, both in the medical and recreational space. And um, it isn't economically feasible right now to grow entire plants just extracting very small amounts out of the plant. Um, so what we're doing is we're taking the, the different genes that are encoded in um, a cannabis plant for those specific um, molecules, and we're putting them in beans, um, and we're going to have them produce them in all different locations. Um, so it's very exciting. It's a new partnership, um, and there are lots of um, wonderful jokes that are going on in Miko, like Miko works and things like that. Um, but and this is a wonderful image, actually, that um, a designer that we collaborate with named Karen Ingram created, um, as, as she did with Miko as well. Um, but then, okay, so I'll switch gears a little bit. So there are lots of different industries that we work in, um, and a lot of different products that we can't really talk about um, happening in the um, lots of NDAs and things, which I told Paula that I was not going to bring in any of those, which I have to. Uh, but I, I wanted to talk to you all about um, some of the, the cooler projects that I think um, are, are have, have really, really big impact for communicating what we're doing. Um, so we call them compelling organism designs. Um, and it's the idea that there are organisms that have a wonderful narrative behind them. Um, and so you, know, you tell them you're working on this, and then they go, oh, how do you do it? And like, yeah. We tell you about it. So uh, one that I've been working on right now um, is actually recreating the fragrance of extinct flowers. Um, and so we asked the question, you know, we were talking about different types of fragrances in, um, in, in flavors and fragrance industry, and we said, okay, you know, these all specific molecules, how do we talk about it? And we're like, wait a second, you know, we love Jurassic Park. It's definitely um, uh, a, a, a big pun team at I think so, uh, as, as a whole. Um, so we asked the question, what if we could bring back the scent of a flower um, you know, that humans drove to extinction over 100 years ago. So um, we went into the Harvard Herbarium, actually, and there are millions of specimens. They have these wonderful folders, and there are all these wonderful old school library trade shelves, you know, these digitized. Um, and so we really scoured the shelves for all sorts of different um, plants that have, haven't been seen in the wild, um, but experienced by a human um, alive today. And so, um, I'll introduce you to two of them that we're working on right now. Um, but it, so um, one of them is Ornectal Sipulata, and this plant is actually um, derived from the, um, the, the Ohio River region in Kentucky. And so it was um, it, it went extinct uh, when uh, different types of buffalo were um, were displaced after dams um, were, were put into the river system. Um, and so it hasn't been seen by humans today, um, and so the only way that you can actually get DNA um, to start to explore what this plant could have smelled like um, is to go into the Harvard herbarium. Um, you know, you take wonderful little forceps that are all sterilized. And you take, they were very generous in letting us sample very tiny pieces. Um, and so we did a lot of paleogenomic sleuthing. Um, oh wait, also oh, here's the other part. Um, so this is the Viscidelphus vulgariana, and um, this plant is actually from Hawaii, and 
there's this uh, wonderful narrative about um, the the researcher um, that this is named after, who is in the, the, the lava fields of Hawaii, and this is the last one, and that that's what he had just said. Um, you know, his wings were drooping and he ended up managing to, to collect one branch. Um, but it was also during the extinction um, because of the introduction of cattle um, it, it into these lava fields of common. And so um, it's, a, it's a concept of what uh, has a big part too. So um, we can help them by the cheap way they use. Um, but anyway, so you might be saying, okay, so how did, like, what's the point? How do you do this? So you, you sequence the DNA. Um, and there's a lot of um, of the genomic sleuthing that goes into piecing back together some of the archaic damage to DNA. You know, as DNA ages, it starts to break down, and so there's some gaps in in um, in, in reading the DNA. Okay, but which you know which genes are responsible for constructing the plant and how do we differentiate it? Um, and so what we did is we actually so this slide doesn't show that, but um. So what we did is um, we did some really cool pilots from the IP people, and they created thousands of different hypothetical situations of how the DNA could have been filtered. And uh, the idea was, you know, take existing plants that are, are closely related, um, or use different types of machine learning algorithms to predict what would have made the most sense to fit in there. Um, so what we did is then we took those genes and we put them in wheat, um, so we just take their wheat, um, and, and we grew up the the um the cells to, to see what greater quality was able to produce it. Um, and so the next phase of the project is, is ongoing right now. Um, we're collaborating with a very dramatic Norwegian fragrance artist named Sissel Tola. Um, and this is her laboratory in Berlin. Um, and you know, she she's very lacking, very creative, and has wonderful ways of interpreting um, both the, the narratives that have been written about this plant. Um, as well as body vision, uh, in coming up with different scenarios of the ratios of these different molecules. Um, and and it's, a, it's a really wonderful product. Um, and the other exciting thing is that we're actually going on a tour with it this spring. Um, so 2019 is the, the big year for the biodesign world. And so um, the, the Coffee Dew in Paris has created an exhibition. Um, the Milan Design Triennale has um, a wonderful exhibition called Broken Nature that's being um, uh, put together by a moment curator who's been very active in the space. Um, and the other exciting part is that we're actually going to be doing a limited edition product drop. Um, so I'm very actively engaged in this side of it right now. Okay. How is it that we create um, a, a fragrance and a product that people can experience and interact with um, in a very accessible way? So if they take us to an exhibition, how is it that we um, we put this all together? And so um, also, I wanted to mention so that the collaborator that we're working with on actually experience part of this is Jamie Ginsburg, who's based in the UK. Um, it's, been, it's been a really active and critical voice um, that's necessarily in understanding the kind of that we create the technology that we do. Um, so stay tuned for this. Uh, I've I, I been put in the work to call it if anybody's interested. <laughs> um, but another really organism design project that we're working with, I'll just say a few more. Um, is um, actually thinking about gear. So we're like, okay, so we, we ferment things all the time. Um, what if we could engineer different types of yeast cells that are already making gear um, to produce different flavors? You don't have to add oxygen, or you don't have to add in other types of, of flavor control. Um, and so we grew this in our creative director's backyard, which uh, the Boston Globe was very generous to cover. Um, and so this one was an orange flavor gear. Um, and I think we, we call this like mass speculation, which is my <laughs> dirty joke about mass spectrum. But um, that was really fun. And then the other thing that um, I'm very involved in and we're about to announce the third iteration of um, is a creative residency program. And so creative residencies are usually things that are common in museums or um, for big companies. Uh, and we were, we were literally thinking, you know what? Design is so important to what we do, both at you know, the molecular level with DNA, um, as well as being able to communicate what it is that 
Schaefer, who is the, the founder of Schaefer Futures. Um, and if any of you are you know, really, really deep into the, the buyer design world, you may have seen um, she gave a TED Talk at TED Global University, actually during the middle of her residency, um, about design and um, biology and how, um, how important it is that we have these voices as, as these products work. Um, and so she was studying at Pinko um, different types of, of, of sales um, with, within working with uh, a medium that has a life force of strong. And so she was taking bacteria um, as, uh, as a gene of streptomyces, if any of you are familiar. Um, and it's a, it's a really cool microbe. It's a, a, a big lump of uh, antibiotic discovery. But it also produces amazing pigments, pigments that happen to have both antibiotic properties. So she was growing these microbes on silk, um, how, how we could scale up those types of properties. Um, and the pigments are gorgeous. Um, it doesn't quite do it justice. Um, but she was exploring different types of environmental conditions to change the genes from deep maroons and vivid reds to, um, to wonderful rich blues. Um, and so the, the second iteration actually just completed. Um, her name was uh, Yasmin Carey, which was actually a, a biosensors um, interest in her. Um, and so the, not quite sustainability minded, but understanding how we can use biology to kind of things that, that technology can't. You know, what are the limits of something like an Apple Watch? Um, and, and where is biology something that's so important in being able, in being able to detect something? You know, whether it could be bioremediation, um, but it could also be um, dispensing some of the years that we're exploring you know, how it is that, um, how does that interact with one another? Um, so stay tuned. Uh, um, we have applications coming out uh, in about a week, I think. Um, and so if you know of anybody that might be interested in something like this, please send them our way. Um, we, we get lots of different types of applications, and that's really wonderful for global. Um, so it's very fun for us. Um, and the last thing that I want to talk about um, is actually that Bingo is not the only company in this space. Um, this is such an exciting emerging industry. Um, we, it, we partner um, and, and we really support all different types of companies in this space. So, you know, there, Adidas came out with a shoe um, in 2016, actually, um, that was made from spider silk. Which is wild. And it was on this, you know, this tech conference, and it was like a big product drop, and it was very exciting. People gathered around to take photos. Um, you know, there's this amazing company in Brooklyn called Modern Meadow, and they're they're making leather. So they're working on producing collagen and um, and, and they're really exploring new ways of of, of how um, leather is defined. So it starts with a liquid form, how is it that they can create different types of patterns, iterate on cleaning practices um, in very sustainable ways. Um, then there is an amazing company called Pizzovative that's actually using mushroom mycelium. So all the roots that you don't actually see, um, they, they're they using them for everything from leather, again, it's a very trendy one, um, to also building uh, materials, styrofoam replacement. Um, they're really interested right now in makeup applications um, and you know, little spongy things. Um, and so mycelium is a wonderful medium for, for exploring different types of products. Um, and then, of course, in, in the food space as well, um, some of you may have tried the Impossible Burger. Um, I think Clover in their dealer spots in, in Boston that are serving it right now, um, but it's a, a vegan burger that um, has a key ingredient in it that, that makes it sweet. And so um, it gives it that vitamin taste. And so it's actually a sea molecule. And they're, um, I think, in order to keep it vegan and, and more um, clean cut, uh, they, they took a key mo uh, molecule from soy corn and they put it in bees and they're able to produce that key molecule um, through fermentation rather than having to harvest it in those crazy amounts from food plants. Um, so they're a really cool company. There's so many more. Um, but one thing that I've been thinking a lot about, um, and, and I know a lot of other people in the industry have, um, and I can't say much more about specifically what Pinko is thinking about for this. Um, but you know, what might be the next, you know, big challenge in this industry that, that we're going to take on? Um, and I'm really hoping it will be plastic. Um, so uh, you've all probably been very aware in the news. You know, there's so many bans on plastic straws. There are lots of different, um, you know, um, it's, it's state level and, and country level uh, regulations around plastic. In Massachusetts now, there's a tax on using plastic bags. Um, and right now, concept is so linear. There's, you know, you start with um, oil refining.
money and you end up with um, with, with materials that can't be recycled, um, they get tossed out, they're you know we're drowning in plastic. Um, but conversely, biology is very smart. Uh, and and, and being able to say that it's the original circular economy, you know, what what one origin based is actually the starting material for something else. And so there's this wonderful circular flow of materials that go through the environment. Um, you probably know where I'm going with this, but I think there's a really exciting opportunity uh, for bio recycling and, and bio recapture, um, whether it's microplastics or it's degrading different types of materials or being able to recapture some of the uh, key components of, of the material. Um, and so I, I love this first heckle tree of life uh, diagram. But the, the idea of showing this is um, truly saying that biology is taking billions of years to get to where it is today. Uh, you know, for us to, to exist uh, and, and to it, un uncover how it is that we can, uh, that, that the natural world can cycle through different types of material. Um, but plastic, on the other hand, has only existed for you know, the last hundred years. And, and so biology hasn't caught up yet. Uh, we, in that, there's so much plastic that it, there's this um, this gross inequity in, in the amount of time that it takes for biology to be able to tap into this uh, you know, evolutionary uh, instinct and, and be able to start to do something with the material. But it's starting to. Uh, so you know, there are a number of, of headlines that come out recently about different academic groups that have discovered enzymes in microbes, you know, the Japanese trash dump that uh, that have some promise in being able to break uh, you know key bonds and polymers that we, we can't mechanically or chemically recycle. Uh, but there are really exciting opportunities right now in the engineering world uh, to actually accelerate this process. So can you optimize enzymes? Can you uh, can you concentrate them uh, you know, in, in large enough quantities um, to actually make a dent in the material um, world right now? So, so it's very exciting. So stay tuned. I think this is going to be a really exciting journey. Um, and then, okay, so the last thing that I want to talk about uh, is transparency. So, um, we really think that this technology is incredible. You know, whether it's uh, being able to um, supplement the, the extraction of you know, an endangered plant from, um, from very biodiverse regions um, that uh, have some key molecules that might be really important in pharmaceuticals or cosmetics. Um, can you produce that with fermentation so you can stop that cycle? Um, then maybe it's solving the plastic problem. Um, but for us, the, the key is, is being able to, to talk about it. Um, because I think that genetic engineering and GMOs um, are a very emotionally rough topic. And they're, they're something that have immense power and, and potential. Uh, and yet, there's been so much secrecy around them historically. And so it's less about the technology either being good or bad, but it's how can you apply it um, in, in different contexts for really for, for well intentioned use. Um, and so at Gingo, uh, what we do is we're very open about it. Our, our CEO actually published uh, an op-ed in the New York Times a few years ago that was titled, I run a GMO company and I support GMO labeling. And so we're really operating the regular with the regulatory landscape, which is largely um, undefined at this point, and we really want to make sure that we're being as responsible as possible. Um, and also, all of our laboratories are covered in glass, um, and so people can see exactly what's going on. I would welcome anybody to come visit. I, I seriously, I, I very much mean it. Um, I love showing people around and showing them what we're doing, how we're doing it, um, and, and seeing different experiments at work. Um, so uh, the one thing I, I think that um, I'll leave you all with, especially for the the students um, that will be writing the responses to this um, for, for credit um, is it, to really think about um, not what's happening right now in the industry, but thinking five, 10, or 30 years in the future. Um, what, what is bio design going to look like then? You know, how is it that we can start to foresee regulatory, public engagement, material, and, and, and resource challenges? It, it really start to lay the groundwork for something like that to um, to, to make a wonderful and stable and, and grown world. Um, so I think I'll, I'll leave you with all of that. Um, I think that's it. Yeah. Yeah.
We do have time for questions. I, I'm going to start us off. Just okay. you, you, you triggered my thoughts. We have the near extinction of rhinos. Rhino horn is a hare. So I'm imagining that a solution could be letting micro rhino letting microbes make rhino material. Wait, that's not that's not the whole thing. Open to the more types. So, so what are the potential implementation? Yeah. Actually, so it's so funny that you say that. Um, so I, I'm doing a workshop with um, a group of students in um, the Rhode Island School of Design, Industrial Design Program, um, right before um, uh, the holidays. And that was actually the project that they proposed. Um, and so there's this idea of if you can, if you can um, use biology, definitely you can create those proteins um, in probably a vision new ways of foreign shapes and, and after and maybe there's some wonderful, you know, iPhone composite, you know, components that we haven't even thought of that could be used for. Um, but it, I, I think that that's a perfect example of being able to replace the farm things that um, that had very murky and um, and very nebulous um, origins, and being able to make these transparent, saying, okay, where is this coming from? Who's making it? Um, and, and why? Thank you so much. Actually, real quick, just, um, I, I, there is a guy who's working on that. Um, oh, there we go. Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> with the intent, but there's like a big kerfuffle about it. With the world of that. Anyway, my question. Uh, mm -hmm. Apologize, it's a silly question. Uh, no, the, the fact that uh, computers think in primary one zero and DNA is in uh, well, four letters A, B, C, and G. Does that limit the ability of computers to mimic what the bio, biological world can do, or is that not really a fair translation? Um, actually, that's a great question. I, I can't quite speak on the computer side. Uh, I I think my, my computer knowledge is largely from Tom and what sticks in my mind, but um, I I think it's actually much more expansive. So um, you know the like biological code is amazing, and because we have more combinations, um, you know for you know potential um, you know uh, uh, elements to work with rather than just being binary. I think that it 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 has much broader application. Um, and there's such a um, like a tangible result that comes from it rather than something that's purely visual. I don't I don't know if that totally answers your question, but that's that's a wonderful food for thought. <laughs> Hi. Can you talk about bringing back this um, line of thinking about like the flower and more technology and things like that sounds really incredible to me, but I'm curious if your company is experiencing pushback on the ethical side of this topic and how you talk about it. Yeah, right. absolutely. So yes, that is something I should have mentioned. Um is the idea um so there's actually there's um this uh global um protocol that actually the US is not a part of, but um almost every other country is and so by proxy we have to be in compliance with it. Um there's something called the Nagoya Protocol. Um, and, and the intention behind it is that bioengineering companies can't go into biodiverse regions and extract valuable genetic and biological material um, and use it for commercial gain without some sort of repatriation um, or, um, or sharing of the, the profits that come in from doing like that. And so for us, you know, there was a lot of colonialism that was um, responsible in, in different capacities for the extinction of these plants. And so, um, there, what we're planning on doing is actually taking the, the proceeds from our product drop um, and, and contributing those to different types of organizations that are fostering biodiversity in those regions. Um, but it, it's something, it's controversial, and um, it's something that, that we really hope will, will spark this type of discourse. You know, there are different types of companies um, and, and research groups um, that are working on all sorts of deep extinction projects. Um, so, like, it will be nice. Um, I'm very excited. Excellent, excellent presentation, and it's amazing to see this was it five years ago. I think it was. <laughs> about five years ago, so it's just incredible to see. It's really interesting. I want to follow up on that ethical question because there must be a tension about being a for profit company and then talking Absolutely. about doing things that are good for the world. And we hope those line up, but what happens when they don't? And then I guess I would, I would just go a little further and um, is there is there any uh, 
the analogy, analogy I think of is a pharmaceutical, where at some point they could fund polio rise. That is, we thought that pharmaceutical companies could be primarily trying to help people, and now we're in, you know, whatever generation of pharmaceuticals, and the accusations are at every moment, at every turn, they mostly are, are going to profit. Are, is there a concern that in the infancy of this, how can you not follow that path? How can you make sure we're working for the common good 50 years, 100 years? Yeah, that, I mean, that is such an important question. And I, I think that um, our predecessors in, in tangential industries actually um, it lends themselves to very important learning experiences. Um, and so those are things that we think about every single day. Um, so um, I guess to answer the, multiple, the different four parts of your question, um, so the, the idea of um, actually um, of working both for profit and, and working for good. Uh, it, it's something that the designer that we're collaborating with uh, on these two smaller projects, Amy Ginsburg, um, who is this wonderful project that she uh, has titled Designing for the Sixth Extinction. Um, and we actually have a, a massive print, it's about the size of the, the display here um, in one of our offices. And it's this beautiful forest. And you look closer, and there are these different organisms that are that are um, that have been placed strategically around, but um, they're one thing that we're shooting for. And the concept behind it is that these organisms have been engineered to produce um, or, or remediate um, and, and help um, augment the environment um, and to provide different types of benefits and services. Um, but the concept behind it is can you um, design nature to save nature? Um, and it's something that we try to to consider in every every decision that we're making. Um, and so I guess I don't know if that totally answers your question, but it's something that um we're we so love the involvement of different types of, of artists and creatives in the space who can really tease out those questions and say, okay, who's thinking about this, who's engaging in it? Um, let's work together to make sure that we're not repeating past mistakes. Um as something of a follow-up to that, uh are is your company privately held? And kind of what is the industry standard at this point? Um, of course, you can have a founder uh, with a vision that they're, you know, sustained until you get sort of professional corporate clients who people, but to the shareholders. Yeah, absolutely. So at this point, think of was privately held. Um, we actually, um, we let's see, we raised about four hundred thirty million dollars in private capital um, over the last five years. Um, and it, at this point, we're, we, we don't have time to go public, um, but it, it's something that is very much on our minds and, and who influences where the projects go and, um, and, and how it is that we choose what to work on. Um, so actually, this kind of ties into your question too. Um, uh, one thing that I did mention is that we're actually working with the U.S. government on a number of different projects, um, both from a, a biosecurity standpoint as well as um, uh, a more of an exploratory standpoint. Through, um, the, the company actually got its start um, for the first few years uh, on exclusively government grants in Sharpa and Arcadia and things like that. Um, and, and so that goes a bit beyond your question, but um, yeah, something that's just important to know. So yeah, for us, that's sticky. <laughs> I had a similar question. Um, I guess from a corporate standpoint, what type of systems do you guys have in place to ensure? Um, diverse consideration of, uh, yeah, absolutely. So that's actually one um, of my roles at the company. I realized I didn't quite say what I do at Cinco, but um, so um, through the I, I work in a kind of a hybrid role in, in um, working with the creative director, the CEO, and chief director all have their own like, central project. Um, but so ethical side is, is something that's so important to us, um, and it, it there are a lot of cautionary tales that have come out of the, the industry itself. Um, like Jurassic Park is something that is very, very much speculative but very real. Um, and so for us, um, you know, things like uh, I think, and if anybody at Daniel's looking at this, they're going to be very mad at me for mentioning the, the term CRISPR babies. Um, but things like that are, 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 I don't know if anybody heard about that in the news, but um, yeah, there, there was a group in China that actually engineered um, you know, human embryos um, with CRISPR. Um, and so there are a lot of ethical considerations. And so, um, for us, uh, it, we see uh, 
the, the knowledge that he's an actor the technology that we work with as um as something that's incredibly powerful and it's beyond what we ourselves can think about every day. Um and, and so for us being able to to go through the process of, of working with designers, talking with different regulatory um the holders, uh the people in positions in regulatory power, um, it really helped us shape the direction that we take. Well, for many of the parts that are the consequences of this part of our narrative and the technology? Hmm. I would say the the, the negative uh, consequences that were unforeseen is mainly the 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 um the failed experiment. So I I almost put in some data actually. There's a project that we worked on um, where we were trying to get a certain enzyme for a pharmaceutical partner. Um we ended up in, in improving it. 40x uh, through discovery and money. Um, but you know, there was one that was amazing, and about 95% of the enzymes that we prototyped completely failed. Um, and so that's one thing. And there's uh, an amazing artist in space named Corey Cat, um, who is based out of um, Australia. Uh, and he um, they, he has a really wonderful talk um, back in December, and he was saying that you know these museums and all these exhibitions. Um, one thing that we never talked about is the process and the failures and successes and how you get to the point. Um, you know, when Dolly, the, the engineer sheet, the clone sheet, um, you know, was um, was exhibited and talked about, we talked about all these other failed experiments. Um, and, and so um, that's, yeah, it, it, it's an important aspect that the NASA didn't talk about as much. But um, for the upside, I think it's actually enzyme discovery. So enzymes is DNA. The structure of a cell to make an enzyme, and the enzymes are the ones that actually carry out the different reactions that are really important to them. Um, and so we've been able to discover enzymes that have never been characterized before. Like, oh, this is so cool. Like, how could we use this? You know, or like, what kind of impact does this make? Um, so, yes, not, nothing bad yet. <laughs> Labs are known to be extremely high energy using in developing prototypes. Is, is your focus on creating sustainable products and the whole for the sort of aspect? What sort of procedures do you have in place to make sure that the creation of these products is also done? Oh, that's a great question. So actually, um, it is in our economic interest to be able to reduce those things, um, which has a, an added bonus. So actually, uh, by hand, most molecular uh, uh, biology experiments are, are limited in volume by the amount um, of a liquid that a given person could pipette. Um, so usually it's about one microliter. Um, but we've actually adopted um, robot ethanol in containing the things that I said before, but um, that are acoustic liquid samplers. And so these things we found ways to shoot little like nanometer droplets of water or, or you know chemicals um in space to transfer them and so you don't need any of these big plastic tips um all of your reactions can get miniaturized and so um you can use fewer fewer chemicals and reagents um for experiments and so um it, it's a very conscious um effort on, on our part to be able to reduce that footprint wherever we can Um, so typically when I'm talking about producing some sort of farm 
physical ingredients or polymer precursor, that all happens within a closed environment. Um, you have a fermentation tank, you know, that's what's happening in there. Um, the conditions are very precise, and if they're not, then the organisms die. Um, and you have to process that um, that waste in a very specific way to extract that your, um, your, your design in the field. Um, but that's something that we're working on right now. Um, and in the team, there's a lot of different policymakers and saying, we, we don't have any organisms right now that would survive the environment, and we're not ready to, to, to release any. Um, but what are the factors um, that go into that? How would an organism be in that type of environment? Um, and, and how do we create ways that, that protect all different stakeholders in that system? Hmm? Um, just one quick follow up. Um, yeah. They did come up with chemical rice that added um, the golden rice. Yeah. Yellow rice, right? And then the country won't accept it because they wouldn't accept it to all. So all the people that were making that garlic diet then could not grow that rice. No, but that's, I, that's, that's an interesting perspective, and I think it's something that, that we face every single day. You know, we work with customers in all different industries, and some are incredibly sensitive to genetically modified organisms, um, and some do not care at all. And, and, and so for us, being able to talk about the technology and, and really um, apply context to, to choose why it's beneficial um, or, or where it could be um, that adding value uh, is it, really important. And, and so, Gold and Rice is a really great example of the hurdles that we still face in, in being able to, um, to convince public opinion that, 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 um, that it's something that we should, we should be able to do. Um, and so, for us, the more we can get um, uh, mass media articles out and, and really talk about the potential of this technology, the, the better. Well, I think we should stop here. If anybody wants to come forward and chat with Kit a little bit after, I'm sure she'd be happy to hang around for a few minutes. Can we give her another round of applause? <laughs> and as usual, if you could help bring uh, chairs to the back right corner, back about.